Hi, uh, this is Janet Fitch. Um, I'm a novelist and uh, I appear uh, every Wednesday at noon on Facebook um, for Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions um, either live here in the chat uh, or through my website, uh, Janet Fitch Writes. You can send me a, a question and I can design a Writing Wednesday. Um, uh, around your question. So, uh, welcome. And today we have uh, a question that came to me through my website um, from uh, Malaika Costello, a dotary. So, uh, I always like to get the questions uh, from you. Uh, it gives me a little time to think. Uh, although I'm happy to answer questions that appear in the comments, so ask away if you like. Uh, today, the question had been um, from Malaika. Hi, Jeffrey. Uh, hi, Janet. Uh, I love writing Wednesdays. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about description? in an upcoming one. Yeah, I'm doing yours. I'm glad you're here, Malika. Um, uh, can you talk about description in an upcoming Writing Wednesday or talk, uh, touch on it this week? I am working on how to teach descriptive writing and I'm looking for the best writers of description, setting characters to point to. Bonus if they're not Europeans. Hi, Zunaid. Um, I suggested Dubliners by Joyce. Well, uh, everybody, hi Wendy, uh, everybody who has a favorite uh, author for, you know, descriptive firepower, uh, please put it in the comments for, um, for Malaika to have uh, uh, some uh, new names and who you think uh, does really good descriptive writing. Um, I certainly, um, it's something that I uh, intentionally bear down on. You know, I, I, I want the reader to have a very vivid picture of what I'm seeing, what I'm, what I'm writing about. Uh, I want people to be able to walk into my books and experience it as if they are in the story. Um, so uh, as many people who've worked with me know that the ability to describe something uh, has, has several components. Uh, my, I remember my daughter uh, was in a wilderness leadership program and they had a, a long backpacking trip and they they visited uh, Green Mesa in uh, Utah and they'd hiked to the top and it was the sun was going down and it was just these layers and layers and layers of color you know the shapes of the mesas you know marching to the horizon drenched in red and gold um, yeah, it was quite a sight. And someone on the trip said, uh, there are no words to describe this, as people often do. They say There's, there are no words to describe this. And my daughter, daughter of a writer, um, said, oh yeah, there are. <laughs> there are words to describe what you're seeing, but you need to develop the descriptive um, strength to be able to describe something that complex uh, as the Green Mesa at sunset. Um, I mean, when I teach, I, I, I sometimes, there's like no description at all. People, they just don't know how to even begin to describe the physical world. Um, you get a lot of dialogue because people watch a lot of television. They watch a lot of movies, they watch a lot of TV. Uh, they live in a world of people talking. But the ability to describe something 
you have to start simple. You have to start with a simple object. Can you describe this cup? This cup, you know, to say it's a blue cup, it just doesn't give your reader a vivid picture. It's a blue, she picked up the blue cup. Okay, it's a coffee mug, a little better, but still, I'm not giving the reader a vivid picture. I'm not using, not only, because description is not just using language. Description of the physical world is using the senses, using, um, each sense has its own vocabulary and they work together as well. So you can have a loud suit. You know, that's a, that's a, uh, an auditory impression word. The vocabulary is from the world of sound, but it's describing a physical, a, um, a, a uh, color. So it's describing something visual. Um, synesthesia, yeah. So you use synesthesia often to help you with this. So let's go back to the coffee cup. Describing the cup, you know, first you have to learn how to describe a coffee cup. Pick an object and sit there and describe it and describe it and, you know, making sure that you, um, when you write the cliches, the expected, you know, make sure that you cross that out and keep trying until you get something interesting. Um, so this is, des I'm describing the coffee cup. Okay, so if I'm really bearing down on my description, and you wouldn't necessarily use all of this in a piece of writing, but it's like weightlifting. It's like doing reps at the gym. You know, you have to do those reps to build the muscle um, so that when it comes to the Green Mesa, you have the language available to you. You have the approaches. And how do you describe a physical um phenomenon. So we go back to the cup of coffee. Um, it's a certain shape. Okay, I'm going to call that cylindrical. A cylindrical coffee mug. It's got a color, which is, um, you could say, a, a royal blue. Uh, you could call it a Dutch blue. You could call it indigo a blue. If you want a certain mood, you could call it the middle of my depression blue, you know, doing color, you know, working on color names. Um, when I teach writing from the senses, uh, we have a whole session on light and color. And it's very fun to make up color names, like imagine you're naming paint colors. So this is a three in the morning blue. So the coffee cup, although it kind of clashes with the idea of coffee, which is a, usually a morning thing, um, it's a um, it's a little darker than lapis, uh, but lapis has a beautiful sound. And evidently, Dylan Thomas, when he came to naming his birds and stuff in his poetry, evidently he has these wonderful names of birds, the curlew and the this and the that. And, you know, but to read about him, uh, evidently he couldn't tell a sparrow from a stork, you know. <laughs> but the sound of the words, he appre as a poet, he appreciated the sound of the words. So we'll get back to describing the coffee cup. All right, so the coffee cup, you could describe the shape. You can describe the color. You can describe, you know, inner, outer. Um, how deep was it? How big was it? How deep was it? How heavy was it? Um, you know, there's cups that are, that are made of, of fine, fine porcelain, which is very, very thin and very, very strong. Um, and you can actually see light through it. This is stoneware, heavy, chips, 
because it's not as strong. It's not as fine a clay, right? So stoneware mug glazed, you know, this doesn't come, clay doesn't come in this color, you know? So glazed, you get a nice verb in there. Glazed, and it's extremely shiny. Glazed to a high shine. And then you can even describe how the highlights, we don't see objects, you know, when you get to vision, we don't see objects, we see light falling on objects. So describing the light on the object is very interesting. If you were a an artist, which you are, uh, you would look at this and you would see cylindrical. You would notice where the highlights are. You would paint the highlights, the glazed strips. You would describe the curve of the handle. like, And you might use a metaphor, handle like an ear. Maybe we're listening to something in your, in your story and then, you know, the handle like an ear would be interesting. Um, weight, when you start to describe, learn to describe objects working that muscle, you're looking at, um, it's good to handle something, handle a series of objects of different textures. Touch is texture, right? But it includes weight, it includes uh, is it firm or does it give? You know, you throw this at somebody, you're going to dent their head. It's hard. It is, uh, it's smooth as opposed to rough. Handle a bunch of objects one after the other and really try to, just, don't look at them, really try to describe their tactility, how they feel in the hand. This is a little bigger than my palm, a little bigger than my hand, my fingers can't wrap, wrap around, and it's a very soothing, solid feel in, in the palm of my hand. So I could imagine a character in a, in a uh, scene having heard some bad news or listening to something upsetting and then pressing their palm to the smooth, warm, you know, concavity or convexity of the coffee cup and feeling it, coffee mug, um, because of the size. So think about the, it has a, a concavity in the bottom where if you're taking it out of the dishwasher or out of the sink, uh, it'll keep water there and then it'll spill when you turn it over. Uh, an unpleasant surprise if it's cold and you're barefoot in the morning. Um, then you go to, so what does it sound like? You know, the coffee cup, uh, you know, hit the, the corner of the table. That's plastic, so that doesn't have an interesting sound. Not a very, not a, not a big ring. It's sort of a chip, chip sound. What kind of a sound does it make? Your nails, somebody like taps on it in a nervous scene. They're tapping on their coffee cup, and it has kind of a tinking, tink. I'd call that a tink. So, I mean, literally work on an object, do this, get 10 objects, put on a timer, give it a minute, describe as much as you can about the various textures of that um, object in a minute. Then pick up the next thing and feel it and put it against your face. Put it against your, you know, texture is all over. So you just, you start developing vocabulary for texture, for sound, for light, for scent, you know. And so that when you go into a complex environment like the Green Mesa of of Utah at sunset. You see how you can apply the vocabulary that you have established for the various senses and apply it to what you're seeing. Color. 
you know, try to see as an artist sees. If you were going to paint that, how would you begin to paint it? When you look at a person, how do you describe a person? I, if I ever see another, she was beautiful with blonde hair and blue eyes, it tells you nothing. Cousin it could be blonde hair and blue eyes, right? Um, so instead, you paint their face, like where does the light fall? You know, the words that describe light, you know, anything water can do, light can do. Anything the hand can do, light can do. So it pooled on her high forehead. It bisected her nose, tracing the, the ball of her nose. It spilled down her upper lip, short upper lip. It etched the lines, anything an artist can do. So it can etch, it can burnish, it can rub, it can um, wash, anything water can do. It splashed the, the left side of her face, uh, the glare from the window splashed the left side of her face, casting the right into shadow. Um, and just, you know, follow any object. So I'm an object too. A person sitting in the sun is an object as well as uh, a cup of coffee, a clock, uh, you know, a, uh, a bunch of pencils in a pencil case. Look at, if you're doing light, always look for the highlights. It's like, I'm going to turn this around. Um, like if I was going to draw the pencil case, what, where would I put the highlights? I would streak them down that silver pen. I would notice the reflection in the letter opener. I would uh, notice, um, the glint off the side of the metal scissors that have a kind of a square edge. The sparkled sparkly diamonds in the gold pen with splotched with uh, splotched with um, colors this is actually was given to me when white white oleander was published or when the movie came i think this was a movie movie swag i don't know if you can see the where it says white i don't know how close this can register Anyway, so what? Um, anyway, <laughs> my desk is as messy as yours. Um, so how do you describe this? There's there's highlight on the rim of the can. Um, and then where are the reflections? Where are the shadows? Where are the reflections? The tip of the pen? The bail of the pen? you got to have the vocabulary, too. It's very helpful. Um Anyway, so that's how I would describe that. You'd describe the, if you were holding this pen and somebody was, you know, yelling at you and you were escaping into the pencil, you would describe the bale. And look at that design, the ridge design of the bale. This is what I mean by spending a, ten, a minute and just describing the hexagonal pencil. It's warm. Uh, it's somewhat slick. But then at the top, the bale that holds the eraser is ridged. And I can run my nail down it, and I can make noise with it, too. Um, and so just train yourself. It's warmer than expected. You know, temperature is part of it. So texture is also cold heat, rigid or pliable. The wood gives a little bit. Um, you know, get used to handling and interacting with objects. I think that right now people pay attention mostly to um, watching screens. So they, they see and to a lesser degree they hear, but we're losing our tactility. And so we're losing a lot of vocabulary that has to do with tactility, texture. 
and the sense of touch. And that's the most intimate thing because things have to be right up against you to be felt, right? Our greatest pleasure, our greatest pain comes from the sense of touch. Um, so in challenging yourself to just become better at describing things or um, Malaika, you know, in the case of your students, challenge them to describe, to touch things. What I do in a class is I'll get a bag full of everything from a wooden spoon, a feather duster, or a feather, just a feather, a rock, you know, rock that has a different, te couple of rocks that have different textures, a bag full of rice, you know, I'll get a bunch of stuff. And then I go around the class and give everybody, you know, a piece of silk, give everybody an object, have them close their eyes as best they can and write. And then I have a timer. I, I love my timer. I use it for a billion different things. And I'll time a minute. And they have to write as much as they can about the way it feels. Often, you know, not looking at it as much as they can. Um, and then when the timer goes off, they give it to the next person. And then time it again. And they'll do like 10 objects. And uh, by the time they've done that, their vocab, their sense vocabulary has become much better, much better. Uh, that they, you know, I give the, you think in terms of touch, you give dichotomies. So hot, cold, firm, soft, smooth, rough, heavy, light, dense, and airy. Um, uh, so think of dichotomies to give them kind of a head start so that they're not completely lost. You know, the reach into a bag of salt. You know, what does that feel like? And see how many, you know, see what their vocab, what they can build in their vocabulary. Um, most of us are building, doing it for ourselves. And then you write all this stuff up and put it in your writer's notebook that I'm always uh, begging you to keep. Um, three hole punch or just do it on your computer, you know, and call this texture, but eventually print it out and get it into the ring binders um, where you can use them. Um, vision is a lot ha having to do with seeing the way an artist sees. So not seeing things, but seeing light on things. That's going to save your life. Um, directional light is best. Um, you know, so uh, best writers of description are the sensual writers. You know, people like D.H. Lawrence, people like um, uh, like Durrell. Um, I mean, anybody who you can look and see, you know, are there smells? Are there textures? When people describe a landscape, is it static? Is it there was a this, there was a that? It's not as vivid as somebody interacting with that. Uh, the character touching something, the character looking out at Green Mesa and seeing the light moving. The nice thing about light is it's always interacting. It's moving over the landscape. Um, so it gives you a point of view or perspective uh, to get that big, you know, master shot scale. And somebody could be looking at the sun moving down over the over the green mesa and the purples coming out of the shadows and the reds coming towards you, the oranges, and seeing all that well, they can hear their own feet shuffling on the gravel and they can hear a hawk cry. Maybe they don't see the hawk at first, but they hear it first, you know, and you hear the guy next to you, you know, lighting a cigarette. Um, you hear some kids behind you sharing a joke. Um, so sound is very dimensional, very useful. Um, yeah, so, so that's how you describe things, is you 
you use the senses. First, you do exercises and you really train those muscles. And then you begin to put them together and doing, you know, more complex, uh, more complex stuff. Who else has uh, just really good descriptive writers that they like? Uh, Steve Hi, Steve. Steve DeGroote says Cormac McCarthy, um, his powers of description, all the pretty horses, is, is his vote. Um, let's see, who, who else has a favorite for, for descriptive power? Um, in the f fiction, um, the novelists who are really good at it. Um, Turgenev is very good. Um, yeah, so Zunaid says, when it comes to descriptive writing, my weakness is lighting and how it falls on an object or person. I'm not a painter or illustrator. And while I can appreciate art light analysis, I struggle to use it in creative writing. Well, so if you see somebody for the first time, say this is going to be the great love of your protagonist, you see somebody for the first time and they're sitting at a table by the cafe by the windows in the cafe, backlit. Um, and so say it's a guy and a girl. So, you know, uh, she sees the, the uh, way his curls grab the light, catch it in, the, in their whorls, uh, uh, fanning his the, an outline of his uh, head into the, in this red gold light. Um, that's how you use it. <laughs> and at first, it's very hard to see. So artists, if you look at the, um, at, if you look at paintings that use, are particularly certain painters are very strong in their apprehension of light. And because they see it really, really clearly, you can kind of piggyback on their vision. So artists like Rembrandt, artists like Zurbaran, a Spanish painter, Caravaggio, Vermeer, um, uh, Georges Latour, um, a lot of candlelit scenes. Um, and then all the major photographer, a lot of the major photographers will clear, I mean, you can just describe the light in the photograph, uh, describe the object in terms of the light, um, portraits of famous people, if there's a, but look for that strong light, look for light and shadow, because you're going to be describing highlights and then patches of shadow and the shapes, you know, the shapes that are cast. Uh, and this, so these are exercise exercises, training exercises. Um, and so if you feel that you're not strong on description or that you, you know, in the case of Malaika wants to teach it, um, first think of breaking it down. Sound, go outside and sit somewhere for 10 minutes and list and just list everything you hear um but make sure to get a verb as well as a noun so it's not like just you know helicopters and letting you know assuming that we know what a helicopter sounds like you have to describe it that's the muscle building how do you describe the sound of helicopters helicopters throbbing helicopters, um, yeah, I, I always get that, that throbbing, helicopters um, um, slicing the air, uh, um, helicopters churning. Um, so anyway, we're looking for sounds, uh, verbs that describe sounds. Um, so give them 10 minutes, let them sit outside and describe. The thing about sound is it's dimensional. So there's sound close up, there's sound far away. Um, and so that gives a sense of 
of three dimensions in your writing that you can describe something right next to your ear, you can describe something back there, something in the hall, and something outside, maybe half a mile away. Uh, I can hear trains. I can hear, right now, I can hear cars on the freeway. I can hear my nails uh, uh, kind of plucking at the edge of the plastic seat, uh, and it creaks when I lean forward. I can hear somebody talking in the next room. I can hear different things on the freeway. I can hear when it's a truck. I can hear when it's a motorcycle. I can hear when it's a car. I can hear when it's a souped up car without much of a, uh, without much sound control on the muffler. I can hear, sounds like somebody on the PA at the, in the playground at the school down the hill uh, telling the kids something or other. Um, anyway, so sound is very dimensional. So Jeff says, we notice things so fast in life we're hardly aware of it. Writing is like a forced slowing of that to notice what we notice. It's definitely something that needs concentrating. training. Yeah, it needs concentrating and then that reaching for the for the vocabulary to to not only it's the first act of the imagination is observation. So first you observe and then it's like you work to get the language that then you can get that down on paper um, in a way that you know, you can bring it across to a reader. Uh, I'm a great believer in, I love my thesaurus. It is completely shredded. As you can see, it's uh, had quite a life. Um, and if, you know, I will reach for the thesaurus, not to be flashy, not to be, um, you know, to see how impress, impressive I can be. But I'm looking often, I'm trying to find the right word, the right, the, the right word. And sometimes I, it's just right on the tip of my tongue and it's, it's not coming. Uh, and I will look at the thesaurus and it's like, oh yeah, that's it, that's it. And then you get that vocabulary and then you create you're creating in your writing writer's notebook you have a whole section of you know portraits landscapes you know sound smells textures light uh, and you make sure to get those descriptions and that language into your notebook where you can use it when those objects are not available to you that you've done the work you've You've smelled oregano, and then you have written up all your associations with oregano, and you've tripped out, and you've tried to describe it literally. You've described it in terms of synesthesia, in terms of another sense. You have tripped out on it and seen that you associate that smell uh, with surprising places. Maybe it smells like something else. Um, you know, I've noticed the years that I've gotten a rosemary tree instead of a Christmas tree, that rosemary smells a lot like pine. Um, I wouldn't have noticed that. Um, and then all the associations. So, you know, there's memory in the senses as well as that kind of observation. Um, what else can I... But yeah, taking them separately and then putting them together is the way to um, is the way to describe something. You know, I can look at a simple scene outside my window. It's it's very boring. The next house is literally eight feet away. So I'll get the blank side of their wall. Uh, but I've got bamboo growing in between. But there's also the it's a very bright day. And there is a really interesting geometry of the shadow cast by my roof onto that wall. And I'm not looking at bamboo. I'm looking at shadow 
against that bright, it's in silhouette. The bamboo is in silhouette and the, the white wall, very white behind it. Uh, and the puzzle of shapes that are created by those lancelet leaves. You know, you develop your vocabulary. You don't always want to use it. You know, your my character probably wouldn't use technical terms for the shapes of leaves, oblate and etc. Pinnate and unless they're you know, uh, you know, some kind of a botanist, but it having the vocabulary allows me to see what I'm looking at. It's not just leaves. They're a pointy finger, you know, finger length, uh, pointy leaf. Uh, that's a bamboo leaf. And if you were, uh, if you were a brush painter, you would, you'd make that leaf with two pressings or even one pressing of the ink laden brush. Um, and then try to have movement always in a, in a landscape, you know, see the wind interacting with the palm tree instead of just the palm tree. Uh, always carry a notebook with you. And if you have a moment or you see something interesting, stop and challenge yourself to describe that. You're going to need all of that firepower. You're going to need all that, all those reps to be able to describe things in your work. Um, so, um, Zunaid likes my work for description. Thank you. Uh, loves the writing of American author Garth Greenwell. He is really amazing, who writes about Eastern Europe, but also Bulgaria. Yeah, he's a, he's an amazing writer. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the tactility, you'll see it. You'll, you'll be able to see it, but Malaika is looking for, uh, some recommendations for her class. Of course, as soon as we think about it, then minds go blank. Um, there's less and less of it. People are less observant right now. You don't get as sensual. People are not as sensual as they have once been. So I suggest taking a look at a bit earlier um, writing. Anything who, that anybody who is an ero writes erotically tends to be very descriptive because you're in the body and touch and savor and noticing are very important uh, in eroticism. I mean, it's the eroticism of the natural world. Um, So Linda says, hi, Miss Janet. This is a great topic. Actually, I did an exercise about last night because it was a dark and stormy night, but so much more. I had a lovely evening, but wanted to capture it for later. Yeah. Oh, Robert Olin Butler, Wendy says, is ha, such a sensual writer. Oh, my God. One of my very favorite books is, is a um, book called They Whisper, which is about a man's erotic mind and the way he just sees the world. Um, I just adore that book. Um, poetry is helpful, but not as helpful as probably as seeing people actually writing long sentences, observing and noticing things. Uh, Styron is good. Um, often, um, Oh, um, Dura, Marguerite Dura can be very, very good. Joyce Carol Oates is very good. Um, there'll be other, other things will come to mind, uh, but Joyce Carol Oates will keep you busy for a long time. Um, but we're looking for also 
non-Europeans, um, any specific oats. Uh, well, my favorite is Blonde, the, the Marilyn Monroe story. Uh, but any, you know, short stories, novels. I can't think of one that, you know, any of her writing that isn't uh, descriptive. She's so strong. Um, God, just going right out of my head as soon as you said that. Chekhov is very descriptive, very good on description. Um, but I know that you guys have all kinds of people that will come to mind as soon as this is over. So even if it's over, go ahead and, uh, and put your, put your thoughts in the, uh, uh, recommendations in the uh, comments because it's still open. You can always come back and add, add to it. Um, Ocean Vuong, Oh my God! On Earth we are briefly gorgeous. That that has amazing, beautiful description. I'm reading Rachel Kushner's first novel, Telex from Cuba, which is fantastic description. And she's just she has that throughout her books. So you can pick any of her books and uh, find wonderful description. Um, trying to think of who I've been reading lately. But yeah, just, you know, as you're describing things, you know, just make a list of the senses. And it's like, am I hitting all the senses here? Are people interacting? Are the verbs active? Um, you know, not there is a mountain, there is a blah, blah, blah. Because the read, in the reader's mind, when you say there is a table, there is a chair by the window, the reader's like, eh, maybe there's a chair, maybe there isn't, I don't know. We'll see. Um, you don't, in fiction, you don't set up a tableau like the stage. The curtain goes up and there's the living room and there is a table, there's a chair, there's all this stuff. And then the actors come on. In, in fiction, the world exists because the character is interacting with it. So you, your character wha whacks their shin into the table and it's like, oh, there's a table. Or even if I put the coffee cup on the table, the, the character puts the coffee cup on the table. The reader believes there's a table because it supports the coffee cup. Uh, it's kind of odd to think about it that way, but it's not painting a picture like that. It's it, physical interaction with the with the world. Um, it was a hot day. Peter was sweating in his, you know, fresh shirt. By the time the bus got there, he was soaking wet. Okay, it's a hot day. But that's so much more real than just saying it was a hot day. Um, so Zunaid asks, when describing in a scene or novel an object or piece of clothing that you're focusing on, is it objective or description or subjective? It's always subjective. It's always subjective. You know, unless you're writing an omniscient, which, you know, Maybe you are, but usually you're seeing something through the point of through somebody's point of view. So it's just like picking the color of the coffee cup. You know, it depends on the character's mood, what color this is. It depends on the character's personality, what vocabulary they use to describe this. So it's always through a character. You know, nobody will see this as a, you know, you know, this blue, the glorious color of Mary's robes, um, if they're not Catholic, or if they don't see Mary's robes as glorious, they're not going to describe it that way. So 
all description is going to reflect the uh, vocabulary of the point of view character. So for instance, if my, you know, the way, um, the way a plumber will describe, say, a traffic jam will be different than the way, say, a baker will describe a traffic jam. It's going to use the language that that person is unique to that person and their point of view. Um, if you're going to do it as God in the sky or, you know, um, om omniscient, uh, where you'll have the author's voice, then you have more room to move, but you're still creating a mood as you describe. It's nothing is without its feeling. You know, one of the um, exercises I often give uh, talking about mood uh, is uh, establishing mood and foreshadowing is to have somebody, have students describe the same house, the same, everything about the house, as same, everything is the same, the weather is the same, everything is the same, whatever you pick. And the first one is, this is the house that my lover lives in. And then don't mention the lover. And then this is the house my blackmailer lives in. Same house. So it's just the point of view that changes. And I'm going to be teaching a class in point of view. I haven't gotten it figured out a date yet. But that's the kind of exercise that we'll be doing, is to notice how point of view changes the mood. You know, maybe that crummy house that you lived in when you were in, you know, out of college or what you lived in with a bunch of other kids, you know, was truly a wreck. But because you were happy there, because it meant so much, because it was such a groovy place, the way you'll describe it is with love and tenderness and sunshine and warmth, as opposed to that was the house I lived in, you know, when I, uh, my parents threw me out and it was a boarding house. And then it's the same house, but it was horrible, horrible. And you'll focus on everything that's just the way it's that 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 desiccated couch on the porch will be a wonderful sagging thing in one. And it'll be like this, you know, hideous, decaying thing in the other. Um, so Zunaid asks, uh, if the scene has the depression blue coffee mug, the specific description would not be what I saw, but what the character specifically saw on that mug or in that mug. Yeah, it's, it's, they don't like, you know, that's a cup that they, you know, maybe something that somebody bought that they didn't even like them and they didn't like them and they don't like their mug. It's like this crappy mug that, you know, the coffee immediately gets cold. Um, yeah. So it always is through the eyes of your protagonist. All righty. Well, I hope that I've answered some of your questions. And if you um, are interested in having me do a Writing Wednesday around your question, uh, write to me through my website, JanetFitchWrites.com. And I'll do, um, I'll do one of these on your question. Uh, the other thing that's happening is that the enrollment for the community of writers, where I'll be teaching this summer, is open. Uh, it's open until Mar March, the end of March. Uh, and there is financial aid available if you need that. But I'll be teaching with amazing people. We have been waiting this is, you know, I mean, this is, we've been waiting a long time to meet in person. Um, and I just cannot wait. Uh, uh, I figure everybody will be pretty good by, by the end of July. Uh, so uh, check it out, uh, communityofwriters.org, uh, and see what, what they have in store. I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday, and we will see you next week.
Bye.